Sebu Livinaka, Malo, Talofa, Netakale, Epiawe, lovely to see you all and it's so exciting to have so many people in this room at the same time, all beekeepers from so many different countries across uh, the Pacific. This is probably a world record for the most amount of Pacific Island beekeepers in one room at any one time, but I don't know if that's going to make the world entry booked for that. So, um, my name's Cooper Shooten. I work at Southern Cross University. I'm a beekeeper and bee researcher, as you've probably um, worked out already. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know you all over the next few days uh, over the course of the week. And as you've heard, it's not just a talk fest. We're not going to be falling asleep after lunchtime. We're going to be doing lots of practical things and working together and using our minds collectively. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of an analogy about honeybees and this, and this concept of honeybee democracy. So most people have heard of a honeybee queen, right? Hands up here who's heard of a queen bee. Well, no, we know most people are awake. Okay, that's good because everyone here would know of that. So when people think of a queen bee, everyone thinks that she's the boss of the colony. But we all know that that's not true, right? The, the worker bees are the boss of the colony. Uh, the queen, they all decide what forage they go out and collect and whether the queen lives or dies and also this amazing phenomenon where they're actually swarming and they're going to try to decide on a, uh, a new home. And it's so fascinating when they go out and they land on a branch, they're going to have to, they've got this life and death decision to make, right? Because it could rain and they're going to die and they've got a limited amount of time, they've got to go and find a new home. And you have hundreds of bees or these scout bees that are going out there into the environment and they're bringing back lots of different information. They're in this collective fact finding mission. And they're not just going to find a hole in the wall or something like that. They're actually evaluating those nesting sites in respect to six different characteristics. How high it is off the ground, how big the volume of that nest is, their entrance size, the entrance orientation, if there's combs in there. And not all of those characteristics are of equal value to bees. They all have different weightings, right? They, they compute all that information, bring it back to all these thousands of bees, and they cast a vote. They're all bringing back diverse knowledge, they share that knowledge freely, and then they, they cast a vote using a waggle dance. And they do that without anyone else's information. They just do that independently, without any peer pressure. They aggregate those votes fairly, and then they make a decision. And what's really cool about this, I mean, if I asked you guys what, uh, what do you think beekeepers can agree on together? That another beekeeper is wrong. <laughs> Often. We all have various different styles of beekeeping. But I just wanted to emphasise that this collective decision making amongst groups is a very powerful thing. We have lots of complex challenges, amazing opportunities in the beekeeping industry, but it's only by working together collectively and equally and sharing our ideas freely and coming together like this that we can actually solve these problems. We have a much better opportunity of finding a good nesting site together, if that's what you want to do. So um, I've been working uh, in Indonesia and Timor-Leste on honey, different types of honeybees, but my main passion is Apis mellifera and in the Pacific. The Pacific has my heart. I fell in love with being in Papua New Guinea and the culture of P&G and spending time here in Fiji and all the beautiful people that are here in the industry. Um, and we've been working, I won't go over this too much, we've already had a lot of introductions around the project, but it's a four year project in PNG and Fiji. And it, this project isn't about giving beehives to farmers. The project is about doing research to understand the process of how to do beekeeping programs and also doing research to inform decisions that's practical. I've talked to a lot of beekeepers even here in Fiji and they hear the word research and they just start snoring. We really want to be able to do research that is practical and applied, that changes your management decisions in order for you to create more honey and more money, ultimately. Um, and by no means is this the only project in beekeeping. There are many projects that are going on, and we thank the our, our partners at PIFON and the EU, and, and particularly for the way in which they engage with us, because we have this shared mission, like finding that, that new nesting site, and that means that we're able to work together collectively. So. Um, Beekeeping has actually been supported in the Pacific for quite a while. It's not uh, the first project and actually for quite some time, since about the 1920s, 1950s, it started ramping up. And why is that? I don't need to convince you all why bees are really important. I know you already know. But there's so many other values of honeybees. When people think about bees, it's our responsibility to make sure they don't just think of the word honey. Because there's just so much more to it. Pollination services are critical. Pollination contributions to GDP in every country is worth a lot of money. It, we can't quantify that very well here in the Pacific yet in many places. 
as pollination of natural areas and also um, managed crops. They produce lots of other products, as we know, not just honey, beeswax. You're going to be doing some practical things with a team that have been doing amazing work here with value-added products over the past few years. You don't necessarily need to own land. Before I had any land, I could still do beekeeping. That land tenure can be a challenge in many countries. Um, there's, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. There's studies out there that show that uh, stationary beekeeping can be carbon neutral. The world is looking for carbon neutral products. It's an important part of our marketing that we're all not capitalising on. Lots of beekeepers show environmental stewardship values. If your income is coming from the forest, perhaps you have an incentive to protect those areas. It's a very stable food product. You can have honey sitting around and sell it when times of financial hardship, and our research is showing that. You should see the lines in P&G, for example, when the, the school fees are due. Everyone bringing all their honey down there to sell, to cash that in. So that's really important for income smoothing. You can also find bees buried in snow or out in the Arizona desert. They're still highly productive in many locations, which shows they have a lot of capacity for climate change adaptation. So as we can see, bees have a lot more to offer than just honey. And so we see programs that are happening in many countries. But the research is very clear from many countries as well, that if we, even though we've got all these benefits of beekeeping, if we just give beekeepers some beehives and a week of training, if you have 100 beekeepers, you come back in two or three years, you'd be lucky to have a handful left. And it, it pains me to say this, but beekeeping isn't for everyone. Most people, you guys, we're all a bit crazy here coming here. We go inside these boxes, right? Most people are running away from bees. That's what most of society is doing, right? And so beekeeping isn't necessarily for everyone. And so what we see is attrition is a, a major uh, problem amongst beekeeping adopters. Colony losses are high and production and profitability in beekeeping businesses has a lot of room for growth. So these are five pillars that we've developed. Um, this is something that I was looking at in my PhD, why beekeeping programs work and why they don't work. And these are these five pillars that we need to keep in mind. They are education and extension. These are the social dimensions, honeybee nutrition, pest and diseases, genetics and technology. Now, I'm not going to talk about the last one, mostly in the interest of time, um, but also because in the Pacific, as the minister mentioned, we don't have a history of beekeeping necessarily that goes back thousands of years in the Pacific. And the reason for that is we don't necessarily have honeybees as uh, native honeybees in the Pacific. This is called the Wallace line. It's an imaginary line uh, which a, a botanist invented basically. And west of that line up into Asia, you've got about seven different species of honeybees. When you go east of that, then into Australia and across the Pacific, you don't have any native honeybees. So that's why they were introduced. But I wanted to emphasize as well that that doesn't mean the Pacific doesn't have bees. There are 20,000 species of bees in the world and they are all incredibly beautiful, complex and, and, and critical to our biodiversity and our ecosystems. You have 26 endemic bees in Fiji in this genus alone. That native bee there is the only place in the world where that bee exists. Who is going to advocate for these bees? Most likely to be you in this audience. We don't need indiscriminate sprays of pesticides in the environment. We all need to protect our pollinators. So honeybees were introduced, and uh, it's funny standing up here. We have so many experienced beekeepers that have been beekeeping for way longer than I am old, and I'm talking about the history of beekeeping in the Pacific. So bear with me, guys, where I get things wrong. So they were originally introduced in the 1920s and 50s, mostly by missionaries, and it was quite informal. It was usually for their personal use, um, but that's some early introductions of honeybees. Towards the late 50s and into the 60s, a lot of Pacific Island countries got their independence and there was this big push for this growth in the agricultural sector that we were seeing. And that includes honeybees. We had lots of people being trained on how to make beekeeping equipment and also from the 60s and 70s and into the 90s, we had these golden years. We had lots of our key extension staff going to other countries and getting experience. We had people going to Australia and New Zealand and coming back and these guys have really held up the industry in so many ways with their amazing technical knowledge and skills. In those years, in this golden era, which I wasn't around for, mind you guys, and I wish I was, but I heard that you could just put bees out there and you could go back and harvest a lot of honey. The climate was a lot sta more stable. We had a lot more flora and trees around. We didn't have the pests and diseases that we see now. And so beekeeping was probably a lot more fun. Increasingly, from the 2000s and onwards, things have started to change. We also had, uh, just in the golden years, I want to emphasize, we also had exports from the Pacific. P&G, Fiji, Solomon Islands, up to 100 tonnes of honey, mostly in the bulk market, going out to Germany, Austria, Australia. It highlights the potential that these countries have. We've done it before, it can be done again, and is happening, it is growing. 
we had very strong associations, and this is a massive generalisation across lots of countries, so bear with me, it's, it's not true for every country, but we had uh, the demise of quite a lot of things from the 2000s onwards. We've, I haven't met one beekeeper yet that said they haven't seen a change in the climate and that they can just as easily predict the honey flows like they used to. We've got new and emerging pests and diseases that are impacting honeybees, and it's not staying the same. It's constantly changing. And we also don't have the same level of production. We've seen a, 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 the numbers of beekeepers and numbers of hives managed slowly going down in many countries, and this is not the case for every country. So what does it look like today in the beekeeping industry? And again, this is a generalisation across many countries. But typically we have low beekeeping op input operations and typically pretty low investment. But that also can mean quite high profits. We've got a low number of very important beehives. The research shows that on average people have got less than 20 bee colonies, but the contributions that that makes to people's and families' households is so important. Um, we've got low production generally in comparison to world standards, 50, 60, 70, 80 kilos in some countries, and that's for a whole range of reasons. It's got to do with the climate and the flora, but also potentially because we don't have a culture of requeening colonies, and we'll get to that in a little bit. You guys have some of the best honeybee products I have ever tasted. They are so unique. They are so delicious and amazing. And yet we still see very limited categories. When you look at the shelf, it just says honey a lot of the time. There's so many different types of honey and different types of honeybee products. And so there's lots of untapped markets. As I mentioned, new and emerging pests and diseases and climate change and limited industry driven research development extension and we have challenges of succession planning. To emphasise this last point, I would like everyone in the room who is a honeybee researcher that lives in the Pacific Islands to put up their hands. I've got two master students in this room too and they're not putting their hands up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Very few. How are we going to solve the problems of tomorrow if we don't have honeybee researchers working with us to, to solve challenges? I've, uh, the, some of these numbers are going to be wrong. Um, uh, I calculated some of these and had to put some of these numbers together. But what I just wanted to, and, and when we're here, hopefully we can update this, uh, this table together with more accurate data. Um, but I just wanted to emphasise we have a massive diversity where the state of, of uh, beekeeping industries are. We've got some countries that are producing a lot of honey, lots of beekeepers, lots of activities happening, strong associations. And similarly, we have some countries, we've got a few beekeepers left. Their bee colony numbers are declining. The amount of honey they haven't harvested in two years. So we have a diversity in the support mechanisms that we need to be able to drive these sectors into new stages and growth. We've obviously got diverse language and cultures and structures and processes and laws and governance. We, we, some countries allow importation of honey, some do not. This changes lots of things. We've got different flora, different genetics, technology, markets, shocks and trends. I was chatting to guys from Tonga, they're saying they're dealing with volcanoes, you know, and how that ash comes down impacts on their bees. I'm beekeeping with the guys in PNG and there's hives falling off because of earthquakes. We've, I've met so many beekeepers here in this room that have been impacted by the cyclones here in Fiji. So obviously I can't talk about all of those, so I'm just going to focus on these four here just really quickly. Uh, and in the interest of time, I might skip a couple of slides just to make sure we remain on time. So just preempting you there. This is the halfway mark if anyone wants to do any stretching or anything like that. I'm going to entertain everyone for 30 minutes. So, so the first one is pests and diseases. So being able to identify, monitor and manage pests and diseases is so important. If we can't identify something to begin with, how are we going to report it or know what the problem is? We need to be able to monitor it. Not just, just because you have a pest there doesn't mean something needs to be done about it. Some of them are quite benign. They're not going to actually hurt your colonies. And then we need to be able to manage them. And when we're talking about managing pests and diseases in, in the Pacific context, and this is actually, this is anywhere in the world, we need to make sure that these treatments are affordable for beekeepers, that they're available and they can access them. We can't take it for granted that they all work. We need to make sure that they're really effective at killing the bugs we're trying to kill. We also need to make sure that they're not, not impacting on our honeybees, because some treatments can actually damage our honeybees. We also need to make sure those treatments don't impact on our honey quality and the products that we're producing. We also need to make sure we don't hurt ourselves <laughs> when we're using some of these treatments, because some of them are pretty harsh. Ultimately, when it comes to pests and disease, the main story that I want to get across is that we cannot, in these day and age, stick bees in a paddock and expect them to be healthy, happy and productive. They need to be managed. You don't stick bees out there and they make honey. That's not how beekeeping works anymore. They will end up dying. 
So I don't want to talk about the uh, honeybee pest in the top left there. That's causing a lot of troubles for my beehives right now, and I'm going to be picking up a lot of slimy mess, beehives full of maggots when I get home. So I'm not going to talk about that. I just wanted to briefly mention something about these three here. I've got a beekeeping hat that I'm going to give to someone in the audience after this. The first person that can tell me what that pest is there in the bottom left-hand corner. Top of my oh, Alan's already got heaps of beekeeping hats. <laughs> oh, but I said I would, so that's you. So this is Tropolae maps. Uh, what, what subspecies? No, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at it. Um, and then Apis serrana and Varroa. So I just want to mention some of these and uh, just what some of the opportunities around research potentially are in the region. So not many people are talking about Tropolae laps mites. And these are obviously a really big problem for beekeepers in PNG. If you guys go and uh, chat to these guys in PNG, have a chat to them about what they've learned and how they're managing this mite. But the reason why no one's talking about this generally is because it's not impacting any massive horticultural sectors in America and Australia and New Zealand. We don't have a lot of research on this mine. Despite that, you can see, sorry for everyone at the back, but if you look closely, there's these tiny little things. They're running around really fast. They're really small. They reproduce faster. They, they kill colonies faster. They're a really messy feeder the way they feed on the pupae. They, they bite the pupae lots, whereas the varroa are quite, you know, civil feeders in comparison. And they also spread viruses around. The point that I wanted to emphasize is that we all need to be able to know what this is if we were ever going to get it. And it's a big problem, but no one's really talking about it. It's also moving the same direction, the same countries that Varroa is. So if you have a country that you already have Varroa, it's um, not unlikely that you could get it in the future, potentially. I remember talking to the beekeeping industry with John Roberts, for example, in Australia. We're always trying to convince the Australian honeybee industry why it's important to talk about Varroa, because it's not here yet until it is. We just recently got it. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Let's uh, keep skipping over. But I just wanted to emphasize there's an opportunity here for those countries. Who has Apis serrana in their country? Yep. So this can be a big problem when it comes to mating interference of queen bees. There's an opportunity to work out when the um, Apis serrana drones are flying and that sort of thing. And also AI. But I won't spend time on that. Let's keep moving. Um, we also don't know how to find uh, or capture Apis serrana very easily. We have all this information here. I was talking about the preferences, those bees at the, at the start about the swarm, what sort of home that they want. We know that information for Apis mellifera. We don't know that very well for Apis serrana. So how are we going to, when they get, if they turned up on a boat, they're going to go and look for a home. They're going to be evaluating a nest site. What sort of nest box can we put out that they most like? I mentioned that we need to, uh, around management of varroa mites, and we really need locally developed management methods. And we also need to be develop treatment thresholds better to understand. We, a lot of our research comes from temperate climates, varroa destructor in the presence of viruses. We have varroa jacobsoni here without viruses. So what does that mean in terms of our treatment thresholds? We really don't have a lot of information on this. Ravnil, he's doing his masters at USP on varroa mites. So if anyone has any questions, go and hammer him or John or the other biosecurity team. Um, I just wanted to mention this is a, a, a summary of some research papers that we put together and it's the different countries and these are the different tools you have to treat Varroa at the top. And in these countries, if you put some of these strips in there, you paid good money for this, you put it in the box, do you know what the mites do? They laugh at you. You spend all that good money and it's not necessarily working in some places. These are some of the studies that show that where we have data from and that's not every country. So what causes chemical resistance? Using the same chemical every time, using unlicensed chemical controls, using less than the recommended dose, not removing strips. Um, and there's going to be some really good conversations around this. I'm welcoming these conversations when it comes to the round table, uh, the panel discussion we're going to have at the after morning team. So my question to all of you, for those countries that don't have Varroa, how are we going to keep it out? For those countries that we do, in the year 2033, what tools will we have? It's in your hands. It's in everyone's hands here. I also want, this is a quiz, and it's only for the guys in Fiji. I wanted to ask you, who is responsible for, the, for biosecurity? Is it the Ministry of Agriculture? Put your hands up if you think it's the Ministry of Ag. All right, hands up if you think it's the Fiji Beekeeping Association. Hands up if you think it's the Biosecurity Authority of Fiji. We only got one hand. Come on. OK, who doesn't know? Who thinks it's everyone? Excellent, excellent. The, the answer is everyone. If you have a pair of eyes, you are biosecurity. Most of the time when we have incursions, it's often beekeepers that find pests and diseases. They're out there looking at beehives all day long. That's a lot of manpower. It's really important that we all know how to identify these pests and diseases. All right, bear with me, guys. Honeybee nutrition. So no trees, no bees, no honey, no money. We all know that uh, pollen's the primary protein source for bees. Nectar's the primary carbohydrate source. 
there's a lot of opportunities for supplementary feeding potentially. Uh, feeding bees, a pollen supplement that's made locally to be able to support bees uh, in areas where they're competing for floral resources with Apis serrana or you've got other things that are going on, you know, pollen shortages. The rest of the world are moving bees to different floral resources. We have, migra we have some very stationary beekeeping operations in the Pacific. There may be opportunities to move bees to increase um, honey flows, potentially in some areas. And the one that I wanted to focus on, and a few people have mentioned this this morning, is medicinal properties. So what medicinal flora do we have in the Pacific yet? We haven't done the research. We really don't know. And the future of honey is not necessarily in the pantry. It's not a pantry staple. How much, it, it's really in the medicine cabinet. How much are you prepared to spend money on something that goes on your toaster and your coffee? Not much. How much are you prepared to spend on your health? Honeybee products are high in anti uh, antibiotics, oh, sorry, no, definitely not that one, antioxidants, they're anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antimicrobial, they've got so many different health products and, and uh, ability to support society, but yet we're really not tapping into this, despite the diversity of flora we have in the Pacific. If you don't believe me for some of those claims, some of them are very big claims, um, this is a list of publications for all those people that want to go and read them later. We can send that to you. Um, genetics. We really don't have a culture of requeening colonies. Everyone here understands that chickens don't lay eggs forever, right? And when you keep feeding those chickens, it just becomes less economical because you're getting less eggs and you're still feeding them a lot. The same goes for the inputs that you're having with your beekeeping. Young queen bees produce significantly more honey. That's what the science says. We know it. Young queen bees produce a lot more honey, but we don't have a culture of requeening. Who in this room can tell me how old their queen bees are? So, so this is something we're going to be doing. Lots of we will be practically marking queen bees uh, when you're here during this training. So that's one something I wanted to emphasise. Uh, also emphasising too, I've seen a few people marking queen bees recently, and just make sure you get it on the thorax, not in the eyes and the antenna and that sort of thing. It might they'll get superseded much faster only on the thorax. The last one is education and extension training, the social dimensions of this. All said and done, you can do all the research in the world, but unless people understand it, they know it and they can implement it, have we done the job? One thing that we know, and we can see this in many countries and research shows this, is that simply doing more training is not necessarily going to increase hive numbers, honey production or beekeeping incomes. We can't correlate in some places the number of training days that you've been to or extension visits you've had with your income. But you know what, can, you can correlate with it. Basic beekeeping skills, how to find a queen bee, how to make splits, how to feed bees. So what that shows us is that in some places, some of our training, the, the farmers are going home but not actually knowing how to implement the skill. And it just really demonstrates how important is the association here in Fiji working with the ministry have been doing some amazing capacity building with training to be able to give outcome based training that has a practical focus, focusing on training as a family business. And they had this amazing initiative with all the instructors here and I take my hats off to you guys, it's an amazing initiative having beekeeping trainers come together to give peer-to-peer -to -peer feedback on practical and theoretical topics and I think that's just an excellent thing. There's also a lot of opportunities obviously for overseas experiences and lots of industries overseas including in Australia. I was just presenting in Australia about four days ago and there's a lot of interest for the Australian honeybee industry and also from New Zealand no doubt around what's going on in the Pacific. Um, the future of beekeeping in the Pacific, this is one of my last, second last slide. So I had to reflect on a lot of conversations that I've had with all of you over the last few years, but these are just some of my thoughts and I'm looking forward to hearing what all of your thoughts are too. So productive queen bee businesses with a culture of requeening. This is a bit of a vision. Industry teamwork for strengthening biosecurity, everyone working together to look after pests and diseases. Exciting, healthy, fresh, trusted local bee products. Pollinator friendly farming ecosystems. Farms are not separate from the environment, they're part of the environment. Pacific researchers, local Pacific researchers conducting applied research that is driven by the needs of industry. Pacific to Pacific sharing of knowledge, skills and lessons. So for example, the Lucio going to Samoa just recently, we need much more of that sort of thing going on. Ongoing practical and outcome based beekeeping training, peak industry boards, all stakeholders in the industry coming together to work on an agenda and a strategy for the vision of the beekeeping industry in each country and more broadly in the region. Inclusive industry succession planning and um, capacity building. So we've got young people in the room that have an opportunity to become something in the beekeeping industry, to give them the skills to become what it is they want to do, whether it's in research or development or extension. And ultimately all of this for healthy, wealthy, resilient and happy communities. 
So bees have much more to offer than just honey. To summarise, guys, they're one of the most mutualistic forms of agriculture that we have. They're so critical to food security and nutrition. They've got amazing health properties, but you can't just stick bees in a paddock and expect them to produce honey. And before I conclude, I just wanted everyone who's on the organise... You usually do this at the end, but I wanted to do it now while everyone is here. Can I get everyone who's on the organising committee to please stand up for me for a second? I'm going to embarrass you. Please stand up. Please stand up. Come on. Organising committee. Look, they're so humble. We have an organising, this event has happened because of the love and dedication and hard work of so many people and I take my hats off to them, they've been working tirelessly for you for so many months to bring this all together. So I just want to give these guys a massive round of applause. <laughs> all right, without further ado, thanks everyone and looking forward to getting to know you all over the next week.